We just listened to the first two episodes of a new podcast, and we want to tell you all about it. The show is called Nobody Should Believe Me, and it's a groundbreaking investigation into Munchausen by proxy. Anyone who listens to Murder Sheet knows we really appreciate a deep dive into a subject. Well, no one has ever done anything of this depth and breadth on the topic before. You will be enthralled by the stories it tells, but even more importantly, you will learn a great deal about how to keep kids in your community safe from harm. But what makes this show different is that the host of the podcast, novelist Andrea Dunlop, has a uniquely personal connection to this subject. Someone close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy a while ago. So to her, this is not just something that happens to other people. Her personal story really gives this show an emotional punch. It also means she really makes an effort to get at the humanity of all of the people involved, all the victims and survivors. This isn't a podcast that focuses on the gruesome details. It has heart. Andrea really uses her storytelling skills to help us get to know the wide variety of people whose lives have been affected by Munchausen by proxy. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder and violent robberies. On November 17, 1978, a person or persons went to the Speedway Indiana Burger Chef and abducted the four young employees on duty, Ruth Shelton, Danny Davis, Mark Flemons, and Jane Freet. Two days later, their bodies were discovered in a wooded area in Johnson County, some 20 miles away. Ever since then, people have tried to figure out who was responsible for those deaths and why they might have done it. One of the earliest theories, which still persists to this day, is that the crime was committed by a gang of robbers, a gang that seemed to target quite a few Burger Chef restaurants in the Indianapolis area. The names of the gang members were mentioned in the press at the time, but for some reason, reporters and other podcasters seem reluctant to name them now. Even we declined to name them in the episodes we did about them last year. But, as we just said, the men's names were printed in the newspapers, and they were publicly identified as suspects. It is also worth noting that, whether they committed the murders or not, most of them were convicted of other serious crimes, and so we see no need to continue to protect them by using silly nicknames for them. In other true crime cases, the names of people identified by police as suspects are shared as a matter of routine in discussions of the case. We believe we should do the same here. The members of the gang we are discussing today are Timothy Piccioni, who is still alive, and John Deffenbaugh, who was killed back in 2004. According to a story in the Indianapolis Star, Deffenbaugh was homeless. He was shot in the head and his body was discovered in his truck, which was parked not far from the Indiana State Fairgrounds. As far as we can tell, the murder was never solved. We contacted Piccioni and let him know we intended to name him on this podcast. He was not pleased and sent us the following. I understand to make your podcast more interesting that you feel the need to use my name. I really wish you wouldn't. I've had people show up to my door thinking they're going to collect the reward money by capturing me. I've had guns pulled on me twice. I will not go on a podcast for that reason. And last, I had nothing to do with that crime. I've taken two polygraph tests and give DNA. I've cooperated in any way I could with the police. Again, I beg you not to use my name. Needless to say, please don't track down or harass Piccioni or pull a gun on him or try to arrest him. Such actions would only harm the case and do a disservice to the memories of the dead. Please remember, too, that Piccioni was never charged with any crime connected to the Burgershev murders. 
In discussing the known, acknowledged crimes of these men, critics of the theory have often noted that the robberies they committed did not seem particularly violent. Is that a fair argument? Or does it only serve to trivialize the crimes these men committed? We decided to try to figure out the answers to those questions by going to the people who would know best, the victims of their crimes. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. We are continuing the multi-part look into the Burger Chef murders we began last year. Each week is part of our mini-series, You Never Can Forget. We will be presenting you with new information and context on what happened. We don't just rely on what we've been told or what we've read. We have worked this case ourselves. We decided to do this podcast so we can tell you what we've learned and even clear up a few misconceptions. We're the murder sheet, and this is You Never Can Forget, The Robberies. This week, we will share with you the stories of two men, Marvin McLaughlin and a man we will call Michael. McLaughlin is the only person confirmed to have been shot by a gang member during one of their crimes. Unfortunately, he passed away many years later, but he did tell his tale in court documents, which we will share with you. No one got shot during the robbery that Michael fell victim to, It was just another one of the series of crimes committed by these men. We spoke with him about that experience a few months ago, and we'll share that conversation in this episode. But first, let's hear the story of Marvin McLaughlin. The robbery gang is often described as focusing on Burger Chef restaurants, but the fact is they hit a variety of other businesses as well. McLaughlin would learn that the hard way. The 46-year-old worked as a clerk at the Magic Market, a convenience store located on the road separating Marion and Johnson Counties in Indiana. One evening, in the summer of 1977, he came face to face with one member of the robbery gang, John Deffenbaugh. Here's Kevin reading McLaughlin's story, as he gave it to the police a week after the crime. I, Marvin McLaughlin, make the following statement, giving details of the hold-up and shooting of me at the Magic Market on the night of July 7th, 1977, at or about 9.45. It had been a normal business evening at the store. There were three customers taking their time selecting items they wanted to purchase. As two brought their items to the checkout, and I rang up their sales, and they left, the third person had moved to a place directly across from the checkout, about 10 feet away from me. As the last customer went out the exit, the third person swung around quickly, moving up to the checkout counter. Covering his face with his left hand and drawing a pistol from under his shirt out of his belt in the front of his pants with his right hand, he turned his back to the front windows and held the gun close to his body so no one outside the store could see that a hold-up was in progress. He stood up close to the cigarette displays on the counter, which helped to further conceal or hide the weapon. He was 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 10 inches tall, well built, 175 to 180 pounds, 23 to 25 years old, but could be older. Blonde afro haircut flat in back, perfectly round as if it had just been done. He was very calm, as if he had full confidence in himself. 
As he got to the counter, he said to me, I want your billfold, and put it in a bag. I, not quite registering that this was a hold-up, said, Put what in a bag? His reply, with some irritation, was, Your billfold and the money in the register, and hurry up about it. As I reached under the counter to get a paper sack, he said, Don't do anything stupid, and be careful about what you're doing, or I'll shoot you. As I bent down to get a paper bag from under the counter, my face was about two and a half feet from the gun. I thought, my God, it's a thirty-eight. Because of the reflection of cigarettes on the counter, it looked like it was bronze-coated and had a hexagon barrel. But when he shot me, it was definitely blue finish with a round barrel. In my amazement that this was a real hold-up, I then said, Jesus, I can't really believe this is happening. Which again irritated him, and he said, Hurry it up. I took the bag and held it open in my left hand and pressed the keys on the register to open the drawer with my right hand. I started to put the bills in at once, tens first, fives next, and then the one dollar bills. During this time, the first customer came in the door. The hold-up man let him pass behind him towards the back of the store. When the customer had gotten to the left of the hold-up man, he pointed the pistol towards him and instructed him to give him his billfold also. The customer raised his hands in the air and said he didn't have one. He left it in the apartment. The hold-up man then instructed him to put his hands down and don't move. He then turned back to me and said, hurry up. By now, I had the bills in the bag and had started to put the coins in it. The hold-up man said, I don't want the goddamn change, just the bills. I then said, then that is all there is. He then said, give me that bag. I then moved to my left in front of him, directly across the counter from him, and handed the bag containing the money across to him. He lowered his left hand from his face to take the bag. He then stepped back one step, looked at the customer, turned back to me, lowered the gun, and fired hitting me in the groin. In disbelief, I grabbed my groin and said, What the hell did you shoot me for? He was on his way out the exit. I moved over to the register, took two nickels out of the till, and threw them on the counter and told the customer to call the police and ambulance. I was now in full realization of what had happened by the blood pouring out the crotch on my pants. I believe I made a few unpleasant remarks about the hold-up man. I tried to stay at the counter where the blood would fall on the counter and not make a mess on the floor. For what it's worth, Devenbaugh himself provided a statement to the court giving his version of what happened. Here's what he wrote. I entered the magic market about 9 p.m. July 7, 1977. I approached the attendant Marvin McLaughlin and demanded he put the money from the cash register in a paper sack. He smiled at me, and at that time I told him I wasn't playing, and cocked the hammer of the pistol I was carrying. When he handed the sack to me, he hit my trigger finger and caused the gun to discharge, hitting him in the groin area. He then said, Oh my God. At that time I fled out the door. I never intended at any time of injuring this man, nor anyone else. Deffenbaugh went on to claim that he had committed this crime to support his drug habit. The press at the time ran stories claiming that he had also been considered a suspect in the Burger Chef murders, but had passed a lie detector test. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison for the robbery and shooting at the Magic Market. Police knew, though, that he had not acted alone. There was a second suspect, a man believed to have driven the getaway car, Greenwood Police Detective Roy Sparks told the Franklin Daily Journal that that man was incarcerated on other charges and that Greenwood would have to, quote, wait in line to get a crack at him. But Sparks did not expect that to actually occur. I doubt, he said somewhat ungrammatically, there would be any more pursued on this subject. You could argue that Marvin McLaughlin 
was the one and only person known to have been shot during one of the robbery gang's crimes, and that it is perhaps not fair to use what happened to him as a way to judge what the gang was capable of. With that in mind, let's take a look at one of their more typical robberies. This one happened on July 23, 1978, about four months before the Burger Chef murders. John Deffenbaugh and Tim Piccioni robbed a Burger Chef at 444 East Sumner, which was located on the south side of Indianapolis. As far as media scrutiny went, this was a fairly insignificant crime that did not receive much public attention. Deffenbaugh and Piccioni robbed the Burger Chef with a gun and got out of there. And that was about it. But how does a crime like that seem to the people who were there when it happened? We decided to find out. And so we reached out to a man we will call Michael, who happened to be working at the Burger Chef that night. He generally remembers it as a fun place to work. Well, that was kind of a hangout. I had a lot of friends that would come in and, you know, I grew up on the south side of Indianapolis. So that was was a hangout for me. We had never had any problems at that store. It was just kind of the, the south side hangout. There was a strip that everybody took their motorcycles and cars, and it was just, it was the hangout for teenagers. It was a different time. Businesses didn't even seem to think they had to worry that much about things like robberies. And um, had Burger Chef uh, at that point prepared um, the staff for a potential robbery and, like, gone over what to do and how to comply and whatnot? Yeah. No, never. Oh, wow. I think it happened so seldom. It, I mean, I know that the the murders, the, that was kind of, it just didn't really happen here in Indy. Maybe I lived in a in a bubble, but I just, I, I never grew up thinking that that kind of stuff happened. Unfortunately, things like that happen today, and you I don't know if you look at it as normal, but you just kind of go on because you're desensitized by it. At that time, that that stuff just didn't happen. And maybe it did happen. Maybe we just didn't have the media to where it was aired. Michael was the first of the employees to encounter the robbers that night. It happened as he was going about his regular duties at the restaurant. I was just taking a big bucket, you know, 50, 60-gallon plastic trash can of, you know, food and stuff that would be typical of a fast food restaurant. I was taking it out to the dumpster. And as I opened up the door, it was so heavy I couldn't push it, so I went to pull it. And as I was pulling it out, that's when they come up behind me and hit me and grabbed me and, you know, shoved us inside and forced the robbery went down. It says in the police report that they actually put a handgun to your head. Is that what happened? Yes. Yes. This was just terrifying. Yes, I was scared. But again, like I said, you, you're young. Things are happening fast. I don't know if I was really smart enough to be real, real terrified. <laughs> I was, you know, but it was scary. I won't lie about it. It was definitely scary, and I didn't want any part of them. You know, I wanted them just to take their money or do whatever they wanted to do and go on and leave us alone. How many uh, employees were there at the time? Oh, boy, that's uh, I know it's me and manager and one other group, uh, maybe four. I really don't remember. Again, that's been a long time ago. Did, did they say anything to you while while this this whole robbery was in progress? Yeah, they made most everybody lay down on the ground, put their faces down, put their hands around. They told us if we looked at them that they would kill us. So I kept my head down and I did what they wanted me to do. And you said you took their threat seriously. You thought that they really might uh, kill all of you. Yeah. There was no doubt. Anybody would think that it's going to turn ugly, you know. Right. Everybody knew that they were for real, and they hollered, told them to get on the ground, you know, basically cuff their faces so they couldn't see. And that's when they, you know, basically it's, they took control. It all happened so fast, and no one argued and fought. We just, we did what they said. The robbers left with a decent haul. They took off with about eleven or twelve hundred dollars in a green pickle bucket. You said they took the green pickle bucket. Is that what they used to uh, put like the coins and stuff in? Yes. 
all the money went into the bucket. They went out the same door they came in. But at that time, Burger Chef had a, a privacy pit. So you could only see the tops of the houses or the, the businesses around. So I don't know if they jumped over the fence. I don't, I just don't remember. You know, they took off. No one knows. Michael and his co-workers, of course, felt relieved that all of them got through the experience uninjured. But when they stuck us in the, in the freezer and went out the back door and disappeared, we all thought, well, all right, we made it. We're okay. Uh, you said uh, they put you in a freezer. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, at the very end, they told us to all go in the freezer. How were you able to get out? We just got out once we heard the door wow. open and close. We waited a few, obviously, because we were scared. And after there wasn't any noise for, I don't know, it could have been a minute, it could have been five minutes. It was all so, you know, we were just thinking, okay, we, we got through this. How long did the robbery go on for about? I'm sure it felt like a lifetime when you were in it, but if you had to guess. Five, six minutes, seven minutes, I don't know, you know. Um, I remember at the time there was a police officer, a county sheriff, that was going through the drive through when one of the guys had me by the neck. Of course, he didn't see it, and he went on through the drive through and went on one way on US 31, and it wasn't very long after that that we were able to call the operator, was obviously before 911, and that same officer came back, and I ended up telling him, I saw you in the drive-up. Wow, that's amazing. So the store was actually open at the time of the robbery? We were right there at closing. We as all teenagers wanted to go hot rod on the south side. Since we are especially interested in whether or not the people who robbed Michael could have also been responsible for the Burger Chef murders, we decided to ask for his general impressions of them. And I guess, you know, this is kind of a subjective question, so just, just your opinion, but, I mean, did they, did they, these two men, did they seem like they knew what they were doing? Or did they seem like they were? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Like they'd done it before, potentially. They didn't play. They were on it fast, took control, and it was over with. Did they seem like they might be on drugs the way they were acting? No. They didn't appear to me. Did did you notice anything? I mean, I know know you didn't get to see them, but did you notice anything about their voices, how they sounded, if they had accents, anything like that? No, there was no accent. I mean, they weren't Latino. They weren't French, you know. Mm -hmm. And not to be, I'm not trying to, I'm not a racist, but blacks have a, a, a sound and whites have a sound. Latinos have a sound. Mm-hmm. And they didn't appear to be black to me. They were two white men. We also, of course, were interested in what the men said and did during the robbery in order to compare that information with what we know happened at the Speedway Burger Chef. At Speedway, the victims were taken from the restaurant to another location and one of the vehicles used to transport them was a car belonging to assistant manager Jane Freet. There is no evidence to suggest any of the Speedway employees were bound in any way. The four victims, of course, were later murdered. Two of them were shot with a thirty-eight. How did those circumstances compare to what happened to Michael and his colleagues? Did, did they threaten to, to take you guys away from the restaurant, or did they just threaten to kill you? Just threatened to kill us. They wasn't going. To, they never threatened to, to take us outside the restaurant. Did they tie you up or bind you in any way? No. Okay. And and in terms of um, I I don't know if you got to see or if they anything based on what they said, but you know, in terms of the weapons they had, what was your perception of that? One of them was an auto loading handgun, and the other one was a five or six shot revolver. I grew up around weapons a lot. Both of my parents were, were retired military. and I know a little bit about firearms, so I couldn't tell you if, if what model they were, but it was an auto-loading handgun and a, and a revolver. Did they steal an employee's car, Was there, or did they just walk away? They walked away. So They what? didn't take anybody's car, and I honestly couldn't tell you if they, if they had a car outside or if they jumped over the fence and ran. John Deffenbaugh and Timothy Piccioni 
two members of the robbery gang, were ultimately charged with committing this robbery, and each served time for his role in the crime. Michael was asked to testify in court. And I was subpoenaed somewhere around 81, 82, 83 maybe to testify in court on this. And I got to tell him, I told him everything that I knew, everything that happened during the robbery and what they did. And, and I said, I couldn't, if, if the man was standing in front of me, I couldn't tell you it was him. Mm-hmm. I never got a chance to see either one of them. So they basically grabbed me by the nap of the neck and shoved my head into a trash can and pushed me inside. So I don't, I can't honestly even tell you what, what these men look like. All I know is they were two and they appeared to be two white men. You said you testified in court. Did you feel convinced that the people they arrested were the right people? Like I told them, I said, there is no way I could possibly tell you. So obviously I didn't do any good. Right. Again, I, I never seen their faces. I could not condemn two men to anything and not have any clue. No, that that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a responsible way to look at it, you know. Since the robbery gang theory is generally recognized as being one of the more plausible explanations for what happened at the Speedway Burger Chef, it occurred to us that Michael and his friends quite possibly had narrowly avoided being murdered themselves. It must have been so terrifying, and, and after the murders happened, to think that if things had gone a little bit differently, you and your friends could have been the ones killed. Yeah, I, you know, you could take that. I, I mean, if, if it was the same two guys, or three guys, or whatever, that did the murders, I, I would think they would have, there's no turning back. Why wouldn't they have killed us? I honestly believe it's a couple of just, in my opinion, it was just a couple of dudes was looking for trouble and robbed the burger chef. I could be completely wrong, but that's just what I feel. We know that law enforcement officials like Stoney Van, who took over the investigation of the burger chef murders for the Indiana State Police in the 90s, seem convinced that the killings were committed by the robbery gang. But Michael's doubts made us wonder what police investigating the crime actually thought at the time. When all this happened, I don't ever remember the police. They never once ever told me that, you know, hey, we think it's the same people. We respect Michael's opinions and also the opinions of the police officers who spoke with him all those years ago. But we have been researching cases for this program for so long we have seen numerous instances where a so-called simple robbery can quickly change into a murder. And frankly, we hesitate to walk away from a theory that has been so long championed by Ken York, who worked the case for the ISP in the 70s and 80s, and Stoney Van, the man who led this investigation for the Indiana State Police for 19 years. Next week, then, we will take a deeper look into this theory. We will be sharing with you for the first time court records and documents that shed surprising light on the merits of the robbery gang theory as it has been presented to the press by Van and York. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at MSheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.